So now that we've heard about what no code is and some of the things that it can do, let us actually talk about how no code fundamentally works. So a few things to note here. First of all, no code tools, they typically run on your own web browser, be that Google Chrome, um, you know, Internet Explorer, whatever it might be, but they typically run on your own web browser. And although you're dragging and dropping things around, underneath the hood where you cannot see, the no-code tool is generally writing code for you. So even though you are dragging and dropping and the term is no-code, really there always is code. There always is code getting written underneath the hood. And so as you click around and manipulate that interface, the code will kind of chop and change as you go. Um, now, typically what will happen is when you're ready to share that code with the world, some no-code tools will let you actually get the code there and, and take it out and do whatever you wanted with it if you knew how to. But most no-code tools will just have a big publish button and you'll just hit publish and your, your app, your website, whatever it might be, will become available to the world. You'll never actually see the code underneath it. Um, and so different no-code tools will fit different purposes. You kind of get two, I guess, main umbrellas that I would use. The first is a generic all-in-one builder. In other words, an app builder or a no-code tool, uh, which will let you build for one or more platforms, be it mobile, web, etc. But generally, there will be very little restriction. It's just like a big blank page that says, go and build whatever you like. On the other hand, you get niche builders which will let you carry out some sort of particular use case. For example, if you want to build an online shop, then you might use Shopify, uh, which will only let you build online shops, and it'll be really, really good and very quick at building online shops, but that's literally all you can build with Shopify. Similarly, um, there's a tool called ShareTribe, for example, that will let you build a marketplace, you know, something a little bit like eBay or Airbnb, and again, it's mega good at building a marketplace. It's really quick, it's really easy, but that is the only thing that it can build. You contrast that with a generic app builder like uh, Glide or Bubble or Adalo. You can build literally anything that you like in these tools um, and you can, anything you can imagine, you just put it on the canvas, you make it happen and those tools will bring it to life. Um, and so in terms of the no-code tools themselves, most no-code tools are made up of four you could call them components. They're not always real. Um, let me explain that a little bit better. So most no-code tools will have a designer. And what I mean by that is some kind of interface where you can design the interface your user is going to see. So you can drag and drop things onto the screen that will make up the visuals. Um, and then when you hit publish and give that app to a user, that is then what they'll see. So usually we design the interface in a section called the designer. Um, that might be called the editor, it could be called the canvas, but you know, designer is just a genetic term for it. Um, similarly, they'll also have a database. This is usually a little bit more, um, or it's usually the same thing, I guess is probably the best way to put it, uh, on every tool. You know, usually you'll have um, the ability to say, okay, I want to save all these kinds of data. Here's all the individual pieces of data I want to save. So I might want to save, you know, users, or I might want to save drivers or riders or, um, you know, orders or items, whatever it might be, some sort of piece of data that makes your app work. Then you're going to simply put into your database, um, these are all the data types I want to save, like email, password, etc. And then this is the data. So John Smith at gmail.com, um, you know, Rachel dot Forrester at, you know, hotmail.com, so on and so forth. So you have a designer, a database, you typically also have a, a way to carry out decisions and actions. And whilst a database and a designer mostly look the same on, on most no code tools, the workflows, the decisions, the actions are quite different. So this is the underlying logic um, of your app, the thing that makes it tick and makes it think. That might be built on a canvas where you drag and drop various different decisions together. Um, you might have some sort of drop down menu on a visual interface where you simply say, when the user clicks this button, send them an email or send them a text message or something like that. Um, and then the last kind of component that makes up a no-code tool is usually what I would call a list. I like the term repeating data list, but essentially um, it's a way of taking data from your database and showing it over and over again. I'll give you an example. You think of Twitter. If you look at Twitter, the main interface all the way down the middle is what we call the Twitter timeline. It's a little bit like the Facebook wall uh, or the news feed where you just have 
tweets showing over and over and over again. And so although the information is different, each tweet's different, each tweet is by a different person, each person has a different photo, so on and so forth, the actual layout of the screen is the same little block repeated over and over and over again. Um, you'll see that on Facebook, you leave, you'll see it in everywhere. You go on Google, every result when you search is the same result over and over again. Yes, it's different information, but there's always a headline, there's always a URL, there's always a little description, it's always down the left, you know, over and over again. So this is a really, really common part of building software. We call it a repeating data list, um, and that's just, you know, essentially taking the same template of the interface, the same look and feel, cloning it over and over again, but putting different data in each time. Now, all of those concepts we're going to talk about in a lot more detail, because Although we use different names for them, each of these concepts tends to fall under what we call the fundamental four pillars of no code. I think I threw up two fingers there rather than four, but four pillars of uh, no code. And so let's talk a little bit about why it's actually different from writing code. Because so far what you've mostly heard me say is it's still, it's still coding, it's still programming, you know. So let me tell you a little bit about why it's different and not just because it's on a visual interface. Um, so it's not just pointing and clicking instead of writing. That's the first thing to say. Um, no code will, first of all, take care of a lot of common functionality. If you think of any app you've used ever, you probably had to log in. You probably had a, a feature that says, if you've forgotten your password, click here, put your email address in, and it will send it and get it back, etc., etc. You've probably been in uh, you know, hundreds of apps where you've taken payments, sent a text message, all these kind of things. And so... There's lots of this functionality that's really common. If you remember back to a previous video, I mentioned that quite often, if you want to build a piece of software, there already exists out there another piece of software that works just like it. All you've got to do is take that and customize it to your own look and feel, or maybe add your own kind of logic to it. No code is really, really good at this. Things like login systems you will almost never build because no code will do it for you. Things like sending an email, if you're a developer, that is really, really intense. You've got to go and find um, you know, an email server. You've got to find a way to send the email to that. Um, you've then got to handle all sorts of technical things. Whereas as a no coder, you'll usually just hit a little thing that says when a user clicks this button, send them an email and here's the subject and here's the body, boom, done, gone. So a lot of common functionality no code takes care of. And this is one of the most important parts. I'm spending a lot of time on this part because it is really fundamental to why no code is so important. Because all this common functionality is taken care of, you can launch apps very, very quickly. Um, when I'm programming and I want to build a project from scratch, just building the login system and the onboarding and all that kind of thing can take me a few days alone. Now, I'm sure there's going to be a programmer watching this who laughs at that and says, well, I can build that in two hours or two minutes or something like that. And I'm sure you, you can. Um, but typically, most people who are programming are spending a lot of time building the same things over and over again. So no code is really good at taking care of that. Secondly, uh, no-code tools make user interface design easier. Um, when you're coding uh, an interface, you're literally just typing in uh, lots of different text and then hitting a button and hoping it turns into uh, the visual that you want. Again, if you're a programmer, you'll probably take issue with the fact I said hope in there. Um, but when you're actually designing with no-code, it's more like using a real design tool. You drag and drop things and that's it. They're just there. That's where they're going to be now. You don't have to translate that into code to make it show up on your app the same way. You just drag and drop it to wherever you want it to be. In fact, there's even some tools like Bravo Studio, for example, um, which can take a design file and convert that automatically into a no-code app so that all you've got to do is decide when the user clicks this or clicks that, what should happen next. The interface is already there from your design tool. Um, that is actually why I originally got into no code. Um, years and years ago, a tool called Webflow first launched and uh, I was a very, very early user of Webflow and that was because I was a programmer. Um, you know, I was perfectly good at programming, but I wasn't very good at building visual interfaces. Uh, we used a, um, a form of code, you could call it called CSS, which stood for uh, cascading style sheets, whatever that means. Um, but essentially you could use CSS and HTML, which was another uh, similar, not quite programming language, but pretty much programming. Um, 
You could use them to create websites and web apps and all this kind of thing. And it was just really, really difficult. I'm not a designer, never done any design, um, you know, as a, as part of my career or as part of education. I just kind of picked it up as I went along. And so um, to be able to create those interfaces with code was really difficult, but using Webflow, this no code tool made it easier. And that was years ago. I mean, Webflow has got much easier to use, but there's now all these other no-code tools um, that we'll look at in a minute that make visual design really easy as well. Um, in terms of, of, of kind of further benefits of no-code, you know, programming simpler. So the amount of things you can do with a programming language is endless and infinite. No-code will quite often simplify that down. Now, every tool has a different approach to this. Some tools will not simplify it at all. Other tools will make it so that you can only do a little bit of programming. Depends what you want and what you're trying to build, but quite often this makes things faster because you don't have to worry about lots of little edge cases or little problems that pop up when you're dealing with everything. Because no code simplifies the kind of programming you can do, it also makes it quicker as well. And it reduces the number of things that can go wrong. You know, the less that you've got to worry about, the less is going to break, and that's often half the battle when you're doing real traditional programming. Another interesting thing here is Quite often people will ask, um, you know, if I build a no-code app, can it scale? And when they say can it scale, they mean, okay, it can handle 100 people using it, but can it handle 100,000 or a million or 100 million, so on and so forth? And to that, I would say two things. Number one, probably don't worry about it. When you've got enough users um, using your app that a a modern no-code platform is struggling to handle it, you will probably be making a lot of money. Um, You'd be doing pretty difficult to not be making millions at that point um, because these these platforms scale so so high and so easily so it's typically not something worth worrying about but secondly no code apps will handle this for you if you're a programmer you've not only got to build out your app um, you know with real programming and get that live and, and you know put it out to customers but you know if you if you get um a press for example tomorrow uh, and you happen to be on the front of Forbes magazine or something like that then you could have so many users come to your website that it crashes it takes it down because it's just not able to handle the load no code tools take care of that they scale automatically you don't have to think about it it doesn't matter if a hundred people are using your app or if a hundred thousand turn up tomorrow a no code platform will take care of it and actually on top of that um, you know, typically these platforms are not only hosting your app, but they're hosting hundreds of thousands of other apps. So they've got economies of scale that make it cheaper than doing it as a programmer. And they've also got tons of experience and they've got full teams dedicated to keeping your app up, running and live. So again, it's a pretty big advantage that you have over normal programming. And then finally, no code will handle some maintenance. Um, maintenance can take various different forms. Um, first of all, we talk a lot about technical debt and that is this idea that uh, when you're building something, typically there are other things you're going to have to come back and fix later or, or pay off. Um, that still happens with no code. You're still building software. You're going to cut corners sometimes. You're not going to build every um, little thing that you should have and so you might have to come back and rebuild that later on. But things that are taken care of maintenance-wise by no code are things like, um, you know, if you're running your own app, anytime any part of that software needs an update, you've got to update the full thing, you've got to republish it, etc. Typically, no code platforms will just update themselves in the background silently. You know, there's a full team of people keeping your app secure, keeping it up to date, keeping it, uh, you know, fast and functional. All you've got to worry about is how does it look and how does it work? You don't have to worry about how does it perform, how secure is it, all these other things that a programmer has to worry about when it comes to writing code. Now there is a but, all that sounds amazing, but there is a bit of a but here, um, a bit of a catch. You know, first of all, this is still software. Even though no code takes care of all those things, software is still incredibly complex. Whether it's with code, whether it's without code, whatever it might be, computers will literally do exactly what you tell them. And that's a good phrase to just internalise especially when you're when the computer is doing something you don't think it should be doing the computer will almost always do exactly what you tell it to do it's got no way of knowing if what you're telling it to do is kind of the wrong thing you cannot be um you know wishy-washy you've got to be exact and specific whatever you tell the computer to do it will do even if that is the wrong thing to do within the context of your app um and so as a result 
you have to spend a lot of time thinking about how your software will work. Uh, and, and I don't just mean, okay, the user logs in here and they go there. I mean, literally, okay, so the user logs in, how do they log in, you know, is it a username and password? If it's a username, you know, uh, how many characters are allowed in that? Is it two characters? Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it 30? Can your database handle that many? Um, you know, what kind of characters are allowed? Is it just, you know, plain English characters? Is there acrylic in there? Is there, you know, um, a kind of Chinese or Asian or sort of uh, characters? Um, you know, what is it? So, you have all these different complexities that, that go into every little part of software that you make. Um, and as a result, you know, these are kind of what make software projects take a long time. When you think about a login interface, you think, okay, well, I need a box. I'm going to take the username. I'm going to take the password. Boom, done. What you haven't thought about is where am I going to save that? What happens if the user's forgotten a password? Actually, now that I've built my login screen, I also need a sign-up screen. What details do I need to take off them? Is it just their email address and password? Do I also need a profile photo, for example? Lots of these different decisions come in. And you'll see some of that when we're building out the, the how-to um, videos as well. You know, when we're starting to build things like Uber or Airbnb as examples, you'll see all these little things um, that when you're in the middle of a building, you tend to forget and you've got to come back and go, oh, I forgot to ask the user to upload a photo, for example. I'm going to do that. So it's still software, it still has a lot of complexity and needs a lot of planning, which is why, of course, we're taking the time to teach you the fundamentals. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is you still need to debug. Debug is a phrase, um, so when something goes wrong in software, we refer to that as a software bug. So debugging is going and finding those bugs and getting rid of them. Um, you're still going to have to debug, even though you're not going to be pouring through lines and lines of code. There's still going to be things that go wrong that you've got to test and make sure that they work. Um, so again, you're just going to have to take a lot of time understanding the complexity, finding the cause of bugs, resolving them. Um, sadly, no code does not get rid of that either. And then the last thing to mention here, and I'm, I'm going to say this with a massive asterisk, a massive catch, no code can have an 80-20 problem. Now, this is something I believe is overhyped. A lot of people um, who are not fans of no code or who have not had a good experience with no code, usually because they've not learned the fundamentals, talk about this 80-20 problem. And they'll hype it up probably to be a bigger deal than it is. But no code platforms can be quite restrictive. And quite often you can build 80% of your app on one platform only to find out the last 20% is either not possible or would require you using a different platform or even writing some code. Um, so essentially what I mean by that is it could be 80%, 20%, 90%, 10 whatever the split is. But typically, um, a lot of people will come into no code, they'll start building something out, they'll almost be at the end of the project and then they'll realize the tool cannot do what they want it to do or it's in some way not possible. I'll give you an example. Um, later on in the how-to videos, we are going to build out a, our own version of uh, Uber. And the platform that we're going to use can do everything we need to do for Uber except one key thing. It cannot, at the minute, at the time of filming, and this probably will change, but it cannot uh, take a map and show the driver moving on the app. It can't show them starting here and going from here to here. It can show where the driver is and it can show where the driver should end up, but it cannot show them physically moving on the map. Now that might sound like a massive problem actually when you look into it, it's kind of not. It's not a huge, huge issue. There's always ways around it. There's always workarounds, which is why I say don't worry too much about the 80-20 problem. There's almost always a way to do something. It's just the difference between it being really simple and really complex. And again, that's why we teach you the fundamentals first. If you just want to stick to the simple, you can probably skip the fundamentals and just dive in. But when you run into issues like that and you think they're not possible to get past, well, again, if you look at the fundamentals, you'll be able to figure it out and find a way past it. Um, so there can be a bit of an 80-20 problem. Uh, but the other thing I will just say on that is it's improving every single day. Every single day, new no-code tools come out. Um, lots of money is going into developing these no-code platforms. Uh, so the, you know, I mentioned this Uber example. Good chance is within a couple of months that problem will be solved. You now will be able to have a map where you can go from A to B visually. Um, and you know, whatever issue, whatever constraint you run into, I can almost guarantee either some tool will be able to do it or there will be a workaround, or if not now, it will be coming soon. Um, so you know, this stuff's always avoidable with a bit of pre-planning and a bit of research. And again, we'll get to that a little bit later on. 
So now that we understand how no code works, I think it's probably time to actually dive into the tools themselves and just show you in a little bit more um, detail and a little bit more context exactly how these tools work. So jump onto the next video and we'll start looking at some tools.